So what I thought, I had actually worked out some stuff that I wanted to begin with. Oh, wait a minute, Tom. I must have gotten two copies. Um, so I was going to begin immediately with the material from uh, Elihu, or Elihu, how, uh, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, but uh, since I wanted to help us begin a certain kind of transition towards the new mood that's happening in um, Elihu, and then which is also a crucial transition towards the divine speeches. Um, and since we also, I think, had a lot of a nice personal discourse at the beginning uh, of last time, I wanted to kind of ask some hard questions. And then uh, for the first 15, 20 minutes, I'd like to have you, if you feel like responding, uh, to pick up on this. It's kind of trying to bring together what we've done up to this point, up to Elihu, um, but in a way that you probably didn't expect me to ask. Um, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, so let me uh, just um, formulate these things as a series of questions and some small reflections, and then um, I'm sure that all of you have been brooding about the issues of the book, but I want to kind of come at it from a slightly different angle before we see where Elihu fits into chapter 28, and where he stands as we anticipate the divine speeches and so on. So this is the way I sort of jotted things down when I was brooding myself, because I'm living along with the book just with you again and again. So the question that I would want to pose from a modern point of view, but it's essential to the book, um, is the following. Are we alone in the universe? And what is our solace or consolation? What is the solace and consolation that we as modern individuals or as religious persons um, seek? Is there any solace? Job is seeking solace. He's seeking consolation. They may not be the same term. And when you're reading the book, it's a question you have to ask. Quite apart from your, I want you to kind of sort of suspend your religious commitments. And you're asking yourself, is there really any solace in the universe? Is there consolation? And when you're asking for solace and consolation, in what terms are you asking for the solace and consolation? And what would confirm that there's solace and consolation in the universe? So on one level, just in terms of things that we've seen in the book of Job, one might say that one kind of solace and consolation is to live within a sacred canopy. Job is engaged in religious rituals. And he believes that there is a correlation between what he's doing and something about the way the universe is structured and how he's been instructed to live. Or he wouldn't live that way. He's not going to live in dislocation. He wants to live in some kind of ritual harmony. Now the ritual harmony that for him would be solace and consolation is presumably, because the book is found in the Hebrew Bible, some form of divine instruction which would tell you that now or in the future you'll have solace and consolation because you have been an obedient servant. Right? There is solace and consolation in doing it right. Solace and consolation in feeling that everybody in your family is doing it right. <laughs> and when things are going right, everything seems, the inner and the outer, seems to be in a certain balance. 
There may be a different kind of consolation, and we'll see what that revelation is from the whirlwind. That is not necessarily a voice of instructions of do's and don'ts, or will, but it may be some deeper instruction of being. That God reveals something of divine being to Job. Different than God revealed, let us say, to Moses in the cleft of the rock, where he only got a glimpse of God's back turning away. Right? It's a trace. But in all cases, we're talking about traces. We're talking about traces. Right? And I think my trace is working, you think your trace is working. Then we have an ecumenical convention, talk about traces. <laughs> <laughs> Whose trace does not get ripped when you lift up the magic sheet? By the way, when I was in Russia, that's the way people communicate. In those old days, they, with those, they, you, know, you, lift, you write something down on, those, on the pencil things and you lift them up so they immediately disappear. So it's a little bit like that, writing your theological stuff. And <laughs> so the first thing we might say, are certain kinds of deeds. And I think that those deeds could also, let's say, outside the ritual framework, another form of con solace and consolation is simply this aspect that we saw at the end of chapter 28, um, turning away from evil, and perhaps also doing good. There is a certain kind of consolation in right action that you really can measure that you're not you're hoping you're not hurting and at least if the person is right in front of you you have something that you don't have when you're dealing with God you have some kind of presence and not necessarily absence so you know to some degree if you're hurting a person or you hope if they're telling the truth or you can read their face and that that gives you some kind of a consolation you take care of your kids you give them the sacrifice they need you give them food in the morning change their dirty diapers. You've had your dirty diapers changed. You probably forgot all that. You owe a great debt. People who change your dirty diaper. Not kidding. Not kidding. Don't forget it. Um, and, but those are forms of solace and consolation because you feel that you've narrowed the circle of Resonance, you can immediately feel that resonance. You know it. You touch somebody's hand who's in sorrow, right? That is not only giving solace, but it has a form of solace and consolation in the universe. But it's not necessarily saying something in the wider theological sense. You might still be very much alone in the universe, and you're building very tiny bridges, right? So also, all in the background, we're asking ourselves, is there any kind of a confirmation? Does God ever say amen or amen? Right? Is there some kind of a, it's right, it's right. That's what amen is. It's right, it's firm, it's, it's working. Right? A friend can say that, and then you know that you're not alone in the universe. Right? You say amen or amen because you're trying to confirm something in the universe that's being said to you, but... Is that ever being said back to you? That would be a con con solace and consolation in the universe. Um, so there's another one that's related to Job. Um, and it comes from the very beginning, where the Satan asks, Hachinam, does a person serve God for naught? For no reason. Just out of integrity. It's not expectation of God saying amen or whatever. There is a certain integrity to action. And you know when you can't say amen to your inner being. Right? That's a very deeper prayer of what where action and language are deeply, deeply intertwined. And that is a statement of the way you live your life. If you live your life in a prayerful way, Theoretically, you'd be wanting to answer the world with amen, if we use religious terms, but you know what I mean. So that is another form of the immediacy of solace and consolation. You know 
whether you're a schnook and you know whether you live with integrity. A schnook, I, it's a Jewish term. <laughs> I'm wondering so, what that uh, says about, huh? I'm wondering what that says about Snooky. <laughs> <laughs> <Same thing. laughs> All right. <laughs> now, another, another form, and again, the, I'm not trying to be exhaustive, but another form that is a little bit larger than simply the deeds and the rituals that you deal with is what we would call tradition. Right? And many of you are probably faithful to tradition and don't believe a damn thing. Or you have a lot of problems. But the tradition has a deeper solace and consolation. It's the gestures of integrity over the generations. It's certain forms of actions that have been done that you fit yourself into. And there's solace and consolation in being somehow part of that which is larger than you. And you're willing to suspend certain kinds of things to be part of that. They may not say the right, they may not be, parts of the tradition may not be politically correct about lots of things. And then you say, well, I'll live with that because there are other kinds of things that give me a deeper sense of solace and consolation. And I'll make my choice. Right? Because, and so I'll let so-and-so be politically incorrect, but we'll still be in the same place of worship and we're part of a larger thing. But, you know, at a certain point, when those slippages are too big, you've got to walk out and go someplace else. But for a certain period of time... That tradition is a huge holding framework of solace and consolation um, in all kinds of ways. Okay? Gives you a first language. It gives you a language to express things. It helps you know the boundaries of what you can say, and so on. Um, and then, in some strange way, the other, the largest form of the solace and consolation would be divine presence. If you had it. Or if you knew what it was when it came to you. Right? So then you have to ask, what would be that divine solace and consolation? That you would know it when it happened. I'm here with you. I'm suffering with you. I have my eye on it. You're not alone in the universe, even though there's a lot of bad stuff. But you're not, I, you know, I have my eye on the big picture. You should get your eye on the big picture. Your eye is on the small picture. But that would be a, some kind of a statement. Or the tradition would say there's something that God has done that allows you to have solace and consolation. So if you're a Christian, you might say that my suffering is not alone in the universe. God has taken on suffering. Okay, that would be a... If you can believe that and you'd see all that suffering as an incarnation of God, that would be a big thing. Right? If it's real, but not a metaphor. Right? That would be solace and consolation. The question is... You know, when is that real and when is that tradition sneaking in the back door and it's not really something that bites real hard anymore? I'm not answering the question, I'm just raising the question. Right? A Jewish person would have to ask, there are the aspects of God says, I'm with you in suffering, but there are a lot of other statements. But the question is, um, so the, the question that's related to this that I want you to be pondering, and that I want you to jump in on this conversation as soon as I finish this little preamble, is now on the basis of Job and the basis of these kind of initial conversations, what, what do you base your solace and consolation on? Right? What would you help, what would make you keep quiet and not to keep speaking out like Job? What would be the correlation between the life you live 
and the life you see around you, that would calm your disease, your dis-ease, right? That you would feel that there is some kind of congruence. If there's any problem for Job with the experience of the tremendum and the experience of rupture, it's the rupture of congruence, right? Things are out of joint, right? The center doesn't hold, right? Those phrases mean a lot for modern poetry because they're real. They're not just metaphors, right? Um, Would you need immediacy and concreteness? Right? Would you, for that to work, what would be... If you say that there's something immeasurable, what would be the measure? What would be the measure of the congruence that you would now say there is consolation in the universe? And know that you're not projecting. So I'm not, it's not an easy question. I don't have an answer. All right? But if you say that the human being, if not God is the measure, the human being is the measure, what is the measure that would allow you to say there's congruence? between yourself and the universe, and you knew that somehow there was something right about that, there was some wisdom about that, right? Even if God never answered, what would it take so that you could repent in dust and ashes from what you had been thinking? That there is no congruence, that you are alone, that it's not desperate. What would it take for you to say when Job says, I repent in dust and ashes, and he's, he is not going to think those other thoughts anymore. Those thoughts, will get, those, those thoughts were obscuring God. And now, right, he saw through a glass darkly, and now his eye sees clearly. Something has happened, right? Went to the optomet- theological mm-hmm. optometrist. <laughs> right? But what would you have to see for that to work? So, we tend to think that it would have to be something immediate and concrete, right? Part of the presumption of the Course when we were starting from rupture is not to start from ideas, but to start from something concrete. But is that, would that work for us anymore? What would that mean? Would it mean possibly that if, let's say, only you had the intuition of the end of chapter 28, you had, only if you had the intuition of this radical, enormous transcendence of God that you experience with reverence, and you experience the implication of turning from evil and you felt that with intensity, right? It doesn't have to be a divine presence other than the experience of the immediacy of that intuition and that something then has become so real that you now know how to live with some form of consolation, right? Doesn't, it's not answering all the problems, but you're living in a framework of consolation. That what I'm doing is not just getting blown away with the wind or running off the empty rocks on the hill or being eaten by a vulture. Right? It's going to last somewhere. Um, so within this framework, in this framework of the desire for solace and consolation, now you can feel what has, the bottom has fallen out for a person like Job, or the, or the Job that you carry inside you, right? That screams or keeps quiet or whatever. But that internal part of you that has, that's a Job part, when that rupture happens, <coughs> you see what's fallen away. An, an earlier sense 
of the deep and thick nature of solace and consolation. Right? And then what opens up for Job is an abyss. A real abyss. And what begins to fill it? Friends' words, jabber, 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 his own cry, his own statement of integrity. He's trying, because he's trying to fill it with the prior notion of what had given him consolation. And this is a crucial issue because the issue of integrity is the integrity of what had given him the stability before. It may not be true integrity. It's the integrity of what his actions had been. Right? He had been doing this as a faithful religious person and he was expecting some commensurability in the universe. And so when he says, I'm going to keep my integrity, he's keeping to that position. Right? Right. That doesn't mean that it's true. Holding on to your integrity doesn't mean that what you're holding on to is true. It just means you're holding on to what you thought had been right before there was cognitive dissonance. Right? So what has Job, or what do we lose at those moments? We lose consolation. That's certainly one of the reasons why friends come before God comes. Right? As consolers, or potential consolers. Because it's direct, it's immediate, it's a touch. Right? In a strange way, the book of Job asks that harder question. It seemed like God had come before the friends when he was talking liturgical stuff, but it didn't hold, right? When he was talking to his wife, naked I came, naked I'll return, do we get the good, not get the evil, do we praise for both? But there had, God had appeared before the friends, but it was still old liturgical language. And when that fell apart, it was the friends that were there, whether they filled it rightly or wrongly, but the the human comfort was there before the divine comfort. Well, the divine, I think the the genius of the writer or the editor of the Job understands that. It's going to take a long while. That was the part of the thing that I scribbled Olivia, in your paper, you, Olivia wrote about the problem of stuckness. And we'll come and what would help you change your mind. But I think one of the issues that I think are, uh, however we understand the different genres in the book of Job, the editorship and authorship understands it takes time. It takes time to be open to something, a different form of solace and consolation. There's a lot of working through, right? To use contemporary jargon. But that working through is the only way that you could get to the readiness to hear something else, right? Because there's so many other available forms of platitudes that could be comfort and consolation. So the first thing that I would, so then I would say, so there's the abyss. There is what Job represents, disorientation. If tradition or constitution gives you anything, it gives you some orientation. You know how to face things in the world. You can orient yourself towards things. It's a big metaphor, orientation and disorientation. Right? And that's part of what tradition or friendship or rituals, they orient you. I'm not talking about giving answers, they're orienting you. Right? That's a big, important thing. And they don't just tell you to go east. They just, they, they're giving you a way to face forward at all times. Right? That's what orientation is. You can keep facing forward somehow. So there's the abyss. 
Then there's disorientation. Then there is this loss of consolation. And I think deeper still <coughs> is just loss. Right? Deeper still is just loss. And it's only at that bottom point that you can begin to hear new language, may perhaps get unstuck, or at least get ready to rethink the issue of solace and consolation. So let's take 10 minutes or 15, or where, how, if the discussion goes, we can, but a few minutes where maybe some of you can talk about a little bit of your theological journey or something that's happened in the course of reading the book of Job that, might, that has made you think differently about the question of whether you're alone in the universe and whether there's some kind of congruence. And what would heal the congruence? What would confirm congruence? And to try maybe to frame it not just in private terms, but in a way that other people can maybe hear a larger language from that. So, anybody would like to jump in? Um, well, I just, I'll give a very personal thing. Uh, I am uh, going through a divorce at the present time, and uh, it's caused a rupture in my life. So, doing that has caused me to reevaluate what's important, what gives me consolation in my life. And it's caused some interesting things. So what my daughter said to me is, why don't you give a list of those things that give you joy in your list in your life? So I did it. I wrote a list of those things that gave me joy in my life, consolation. And the things that gave me joy turns out to be relationships and friendships, which I would never have put. Material things turned out to be low on the list. So I thought, you know, this is kind of an interesting rupture in my life. Uh, you know, you lost your home, you lost your kids, you know, you lost a lot of things that Job lost. I feel an analogy to Job. And I feel that this concept of values of relationship, seeing the other, has become far more important to me and causes me to act differently and think differently about the universe. So not to be alone in the universe, as opposed to the set tradition that I was relying on, has caused me to reevaluate who I am within the universe through the value of relationships. So it also helps us, as Stephen is saying, it also helps us understand that the issue of tradition can narrow down to family. Right? It's not just the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition, and so on, the so Buddhist tradition, but there's a, a form of tradition in the family. Job lost that too. Right? So, and that, that's a daily ritual of comfort and consolation. Right. So that, that's a deeper diurnal ritual. Very deep. Very deep. With its own private language. Right? right? That's a language that's mediating between the soul and the outside worlds. Right? right. And that that's the ritual that we who are parents try to give to our children in which you received with your mother's milk so early, right? To have a sense of solace and consolation in the universe, right? That's a great gratitude to parents. Astonishing. Right? So, that too is lost, right? Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, Sarah Jo. Um, yeah, I agree. I think in times of rupture that relationship become even more important and I particularly think friendship and and not just family because that's almost something you're it's almost an obligation that you have those relationships but sort of promise making friendships like friends that you know will be there because they want to be or um, even just uh, in a, within a marriage knowing that that's something that's consistent in there but but so troubling I think about the book of Job is that he loses <laughs> his ability to um, be understood and um, we, even with his friends and I think that's that's what's so upsetting and I think that in those moments um, 
one has to be surrounded with a sort of beauty um, and something larger than them, maybe tradition, but also just the natural world and sort of seeing something um, beautiful in creation itself. Um, but even that, I suppose, it, it's, I mean, I think few of us can even relate, it seems, to the dark place that Job is in. And I think that's troubling, too, is that knowing that some people go through that in a way that we'll never maybe know. Um, so this just kind of reflected. It's not really saying much, but that's how I would respond. It's interesting. This is loss of friendship, but um, it's interesting that you talk about friendship in a different way. You make friends. You don't make family. Right. You're born into a family, or you're born into a religion. So that making is a covenant making. Mm -hmm. right? And that depends on holding the covenant together. right? So if something goes wrong, you don't get a quick divorce or things like that, but you stick with it until it does it can't stay, right? But you know, different generations try to stick with it in different ways until a certain breaking point. But this issue of the promise it's a very 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 strong aspect. Um, giving you word and then um, Losing the friendship means that your word is not heard by the people that you had given your life over in trust to hear your word. Right? That's, that's an amazing kind of a thing. So in a certain sense, Job loses contact with his family. He loses contact with God, and his friends can't. There's no, there's no back and forth anymore. Right? Anybody else? Thank you. Good. Yeah. Um, I grew up in an uh, evangelical tradition, um, and uh, part of part of the tradition is, as you referenced earlier in the course, uh, this idea of redemptive suffering. And uh, it's definitely been challenged in this course. It's been so helpful to me. Uh, it's essentially, just redemptive suffering is kind of a... Um, a lot of times in my tradition digresses to kind of a mathematics of how do we find the, uh, the equation in the sense of all this madness. And the fact of the matter is there, at least as expressed in Job, there's just not an equation that uh, sufficiently... Um, substantiates the situation. It just doesn't happen here. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, my solace, I think, is um, in relationship is um, uh, the relationship with God or the covenant with God. And all that I'm finding as I'm wrestling through this is a, is, is a hope, an eschatological hope of... Um, uh, resurrection, which is a part of my tradition, and um, so what would resurrection mean when you don't know what, what's that? Hope, what, what what is being resurrected that gives consolation? Um, <laughs> a resurrection that uh, 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 John articulates in his Revelation, um, just this being with God in an existence. Um, a reality where there is no more crying, no more, no more tears, no more pain. Um, the old, where the or, old order of things passes away. This um, fantastic reality of um, um, intimate communion with the Creator that is beyond this existence. And um, as I'm, uh, that's that's just not that's not here, and that's not now. It's, it's not here and now, and it doesn't, uh, it's really a fantastic hope, but honestly, when, like, when everything's stripped away, my consolation is this radical, like, future-oriented, eschatological hope that is, uh, um, uh, 
So Job's question to you is, what do you do in the meantime? Um, and so, yeah, um, in the meantime, <laughs> right. And I, I feel like, I feel like, um, it, I was wrestling with this in Nemo and uh, Jansen and Newsom, that question of the meantime. And it seems like, it seems like the consolation of God is the same consolation that friends can give in the present, and it just seems insufficient for the madness. And so the, the meantime, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the meantime, if there's a equation or consolation for the meantime, for the presentness of the now. So the big abyss. Yeah. Because part of the issue is waiting. Can, so you're saying you're waiting in hope. Yeah. Like, all right, let, let, to put that in your tradition, you say you're waiting in hope. But how does that hope bend backwards into the world? Right? Otherwise, it's a, it's a hope that's beyond the world. You could say that. The tradition says that too. It's a hope that's beyond the world. But there should be something that bends back into the world that's a realized eschatology somehow, right, Olivia? I kind of want to address that and ask you follow-up questions at the same time. Mm -hmm. So this is just me thinking out loud, and I don't know that I would, maybe 10 minutes from now I'll like, not be comfortable with this, but I think the hope that bends backward into the world is a sort of um, collaboration with God in defeating and confronting the powers in the world now. The powers is kind of a jargon word for a personified sort of evil, um, but could also encompass the brokenness and the abyss um, Job's experience. So waiting can include confronting brokenness um, and bringing the new creational resurrectional reality into the now. So there's this nice concept of already and not yet that we get from some 20th century theologians. So it's not as though there's a, a radical break between the eschaton and the, res the sort of new creational shalom and beauty um, and the present moment, but there's a sort of living into that. It's broken in but not fully arrived. And one can have a sense of when oneself as participating in ushering in that new reality. But the problem is, at the same time, the world is so fucked up. So how does, and, and one is, it's really hard to even have the strength to participate in ushering in that new kingdom or new reality when one sees how much suffering there is. Like, even, even that sense of mission is sometimes impotent um, to, I don't know, sustain. But my follow-up question for you is, does it matter that... So it, it seems to me that there's a piece maybe missing from your picture, which is a piece of relationality. It's not just a kind of presence with God in that vision in, in John, but a presence of... But a, but a vision of community, sort of mm -hmm. right relationships restored. So, and, and furthermore, the right relationships that are restored are the wounded relationships, right? Everyone still has their wounds in that vision. And, and, and does that matter? And how does that matter? And what does that say about the, the now, the abyss, the brokenness, if in the new heavens and in the new earth, everybody still has wounds on their bodies? Those are that's a bunch of questions. Sorry. I mean, that's I, I guess I guess all that I would say is I'm I'm thinking about directly uh, this last Friday, a, um, a friend, uh, engineer, professor, who was 43 years old, was just died of a massive heart attack in my community, and uh, um, I'm thinking about the kids, the wife, of my community, and when death stares you in the face, um, the the hope the hope that I have is. I guess, a resurrection, a future, like, I, I hope to God that I'm going to see Ken someday. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously. It's, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in the face, but then, that's different, but death is different than 
still having existence, like still living in existence. And so a realized eschatology, um, I'm, that's what I, I mean, that's, that's the wrestling. The question was, what's the solace, I guess. And so to an, and answer the question, I ventured into kind of eschatology in the future, but the mess of, the mess of Job and religion in my um, simple understanding is this parsing out of a realized eschatology that has to intersect in the real world. And I have, I mean, personal feelings about that that could, we could talk about later you know, over coffee or something, but um, okay. is that sufficient? Yeah, I don't want to hit, hit Phil Johnson's on the... On the, on the oh, no, yeah, I, no yeah, but. I'm sympath- I, I share your view. Sure, yeah, yeah. Sorry if that didn't come across. I'm no, just you really weren't, interested no, in... Yeah, you weren't nagging or... Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is real, just, this it, is real life. It this just is, seems to me that the woundedness, <clears throat> like, maybe there's something there. You know, the fact that in, in the new creation we still have our wounds. There's something to be kind of, you know? I don't know if I, don't know if I share that. Jesus still has under, his wounds. Oh, like physical yeah, scars. Yeah, like our stories aren't erased. Mm. Sorry, not to derail, just food for thought. <laughs> let's hear a couple of other voices. I think Maggie had. So yeah, let's go around. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry, this was like in response to something in the midst of everything that you just said, and so I'm trying to connect it appropriately to now. Um, so one of the things that that Newsom keeps mentioning is this posture of of prayer and piety. Um, And I was thinking not necessarily of like ritualistic activity, but there is a sense that when you face this abyss, the ability to um, do things very simply and focus on what you're doing and just be present. that perhaps is not soulless, but is a way to not get absorbed, but you're still kind of leaning into the abyss itself. And I think we like to see the abyss as something that is to be avoided. I mean, we are a highly medicated culture, and I'm not entirely sure that's correct. So I think the way that we conceive of the abyss is also creating a place in which we seek solace from it because we can't handle it. Um, You know, with children who are freaking out, perhaps they have some kind of temper tantrum or they have other issues dealing with their emotions, the ability just to help them dress themselves is huge and that can calm them down, I guess. It's a lot of different thoughts. They're not string together properly. I apologize. Thank you. Um, I've been thinking a lot um, during this class about about the way we find consolation in tradition, and you, you talked a little earlier about um, finding consolation in tradition, even even in the midst of people who don't. Uh, you know, we have kind of dissimilar views, maybe, but we're all in this tradition together, and as long as we're not necessarily on the extremes, we're able to kind of find this consolation together. Um, and um, over the summer, um, my grandmother passed away and I had to officiate the funeral. And I think this really like became a reality for me when I'm, I think that I am more progressive in my views um, when contrasted with the rest of um, my family in Oklahoma, Bible Belt, conservative Christianity. And so uh, when I started about preparing for the funeral service, I kind of basically just wanted to throw everything out. I've seen a lot of really, really bad funerals with some really damaging theology where I feel like, uh, uh, so so I had all these ideas about what I did not want in the service. And, and as it came to kind of reflect and put everything together, I realized that, um, you know, while there are some things that I think are really damaging that probably should not be included, there are other things that, um, that when we come to this time of grief, um, that in order for people to find consolation in the tradition need to be said. So, like Psalm 23 needs to be read, even if I think that it really provides me no solace, the, the fact that we are kind of together in this tradition means that I need to, I needed to in that point think about that. And also talking about, you know, more resurrection-oriented things that I'm not necessarily 
comfortable with talking about all the time um, are kind of things that people want to hear about. People want to hear about heaven at a funeral. Um, and it wasn't necessarily at my point, I guess, to say that nobody needed to hear about that um, because of me. So I just kind of this idea that even when things don't make sense, ultimately this tradition kind of <coughs> provides this solace and consolation for us. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I come from Kenya, <laughs> and um, the Kenyan society is 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 um, is more of an honor and shame society. Um, if things happen, you don't talk about them, and often the joke is used as a symbol of endurance, Christian endurance, that you don't talk about what you're going through, mm. but just to praise God, to give God thanks. And if you talk about uh, discomfort and pain, it's like you are not um, good enough in your faith. And so my consolation, interesting, my consolation um, in terms of what drew me to Job is the fact that Job is able to, to protest. He is able to name the pain. He gives it words and talks about it because when I was growing up in church, I would just hear, and you are like Job. He, he thanks God. He says, blessed is God. He gives and he takes. And at the end, Job is blessed, he gets everything back. And so I, I didn't hear what goes on in the, in, in, in the dialogue, in the poetry, in, in the, yeah. And so my consolation in my life was to realize that the job from chapter 3 is not the resigning job of chapter 2. It's the job who, who says, I can't take it anymore. And that is my consolation. That is where I find that I can actually talk about it and say, I am not well, I am not happy, I'm uncomfortable with what is going on. And so. And you can do that without shame. Yes, and I can do that without yeah. uh, feeling like yeah. it's wrong to do it. And that became my constellation. That's why I ended up studying Joe. <laughs> How about you? Yeah, uh, I actually really appreciate uh, your comment, May. Um, and I was going to say something, something similar. My uh, short, shortly after uh, uh, I was born, a civil war happened in in uh, Liberia, and my mom was was left with with the four of our siblings, and she she led us in and endured that. Uh, for about two years. Um, I don't really remember much of the story, but I've been told the story, I was two. Um, and what I've talked to her about that experience since, right, of, of losing all forms of stability, um, income, peace of mind, um, and, any, and any comfort she can imagine, right? Um, she said that she found consolation in regularity and in the fact that others had endured worse. And so not endured in the sense of like shaming from my perspective, right? But endured in the sense that that they that they survived the difficult act and that and that endurance gives hope. That they could live through that they could live through and see and see things that we don't desire to and still uh, remain as emotionally and physically and spiritually intact as one as one can after an experience like that. And I think, from my perspective, that's a different sort of endurance uh, from from simply just obeying, right? Or simply or simply not questioning God, but instead, like that sort of endurance, in my perspective, comes from having a, an up close experience with the abyss and and seeing through the experiences and stories of others that there's still life beyond the abyss. 
um, even though the abyss is an abyss. Um, the other thing is, that I was going to say, is a piece on regularity is that she would also tell me that they, that when they could get together as friends, sit around and tell stories while like hiding out in the middle of like a village, um, how that, how they would, they would sometimes forget that it was a time of war, that, that getting together with family and friends um, and remembering, um, they, it would literally take them back to the days of peace and that, and that's how they were able to uh, maintain uh, uh, their, their uh, stability. So I'm, I'm, I'm struck by, uh, by uh, those, those, those two things. And I want to be careful to, to not say that those things are necessary or that suffering, right, is, is necessary to like have this experience with, with, with the Almighty, but it, but it seems like a lot of, a lot of our ideas about that come really, come really close to, to that perspective. Okay, so I just want to I think when you're in the midst of the abyss and you're facing it, ultimately the only thing that is consoling is that there is some view that it will end. I think that is ultimately what's only consoling. I think in the meantime, you make meaning if you want to or if you're able to. Um, and so I, 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 yeah, I'm hesitant to sort of put the burden of consolation on the one who is suffering. Um, and I think that the person who's suffering ultimately wants to get through it and get out of it. And if the meaning that they make is their own, and that may include God, that may not. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I just think those are the ways that I've been thinking about. So I think, yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe that makes it necessary to keep us in balance. I mean, because that I'm thinking with the Eastern tradition a lot, where right, in, in Christianity and uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, we uh, hope is very important, and sometimes we, we understand hope as that thing which gets us away from the abyss. Right. But we see in Job, I think, and, and, and for example, we see in Buddhism, that you, and in Greek tragedy, right, it's always there. You can put masks. But you always have to be aware that it is there and that it might strike. So is there a consciousness which lets you live with that awareness, right, but still carry on? Not shut it off, cover it up, as we do it in this country extremely, right? We, 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 everything is positive. <laughs> we never want to confront it and we put a lot of layers. But is there some some way to live with it? and, be, and Living with it does, it, does it enhance your consciousness, your awareness, right? And That's the meanwhile. That's the meanwhile, right? Um, speaking of the meanwhile and the bending back of hope, um, I thought the best doctrine that came out of Pope Benedict's pontificate was on the topic of hope, and he, he wrote a good chunk of it on how future hope influences the present. Um, I wanted to say a few, you know, hopscotch things, kind of like. Um, first of all, to respond to you, I actually, I, it's possible I don't understand it, honestly speaking personally, but I, I think the opposite. Um, and I'll speak anecdotally. I, the greatest part of my, the greatest experience of suffering in my life was actually ended when I first, when I stopped looking at the suffering as something to be avoided. Like that was that, that was a, a pivotal point where I was viewing the suffering kind of like a baby from American, as you said, where like, it's all bad, all bad, I must get out of this ASAP. And it was when I, I mean, it's hard to even put it in words, but like to kind of accept it and see it even potentially as a positive, that it like, the power was dissipated. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say, and where I find a lot of consolation, um, I mean, the world is obviously fucked up, but the world is also, to me, incredibly beautiful. And I, I get a lot of power and encouragement from seeing the, the beauty and the goodness, uh, parents caring for kids, uh, the way people rally in tragedies, cheesy YouTube videos about disabled kids. Um, 
And, and I, this can be cheesy, but I think there is something, there's really power here. And it, it isn't just one side of the story that all is suffering and loss and everything is foobar, but uh, there is profound goodness that is right there with it. And, and that is part of the mystery of life. And we should never forget the, the other side. If you're someone who likes me, you who agrees that there's beauty and goodness just out the window. I think to kind of bring your, your two together a little bit, just thinking about, I think that's all true. We want to leave space that we don't want to just kind of fix right away and the suffering and get rid of the abyss. But there, we have to be careful here that there's a point where we're so paralyzed not to act or relieve <clears throat> some forms. You know what I'm saying? And I wonder if we, we balance a line here saying, well, we can accept this. But then at what point do we, we say, you know what, no, <laughs> I want a better world. You know what I mean? Like I wonder if, because that's the whole tech, techne question, is where do, you, where do you draw a limit? Where do, you, where do you learn to accept, but then also build? And it's hard, it's hard to find that. That's, that's tricky, I think. And maybe that's not talking to your point, but to look through and past is, is necessary. I mean, Especially from someone that sees someone else suffering to help you to do something. Yeah. Well, and just to feel like, I, I, I feel a little bit since I'll try and crack. And just to provide handle, um, my I've been watching my dad die from early onset dementia at age 55. And so I can't move past sort of a continual loss. So it's a kind of chronic, like chronic illness. It's, it's not just one loss and then you like kind of make on, make meaning and move on, but it's sort of like every time I see him. Things and so I think absolutely, I think um, what I'm trying to get at is a way that the sufferer has permission to be really honest, mm -hmm. because I don't think that there should be any other burdens put on them. I think when they are honest, I think they, they are in that, I think there's a way we're in that abyss and we don't, we don't want to be in it, um, but we are in it. And I feel like the moment we see that there could be sort of an, an end or a better Place. doesn't mean we're avoiding it. Um, it just means we're being honest with sort of what is satisfactory when we're suffering. Um, it doesn't mean like band-aid, Medicaid. It means sort of just be honest, I guess. Is that helpful? Because, yeah, I agree. There have to be moments. And, but I think that that is up to Joe and that's up to us. Because um, I think there is a way that there's this demand for solace and consolation that we put on others because we're not comfortable and we're, we're feeling sort of dragged into that suffering. And I don't think that's the sufferer's job to deal with, I think. That's what kind of that helpful? Elijah, and then maybe one or two more, and then we'll go on to look at the text. Yeah. As, as we have this conversation, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly mindful uh, of what happened in the, in the Philippines over, over the weekend, and I've been paying a lot of attention to the headlines and in the newspapers, they've been the headlines are very Jovian. Like the the headline on CNN yesterday was, "It feels like the end of the world." It's what some of the people uh, who 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 lived through that are saying, and I'm just struck by by the massiveness of like that sort of natural disaster tragedy that like brings people to say statements that are not hyperbolic, right? That like that like they feel that like to say they've lost everything, right, is an understatement for them. And another headline I think they said, it feels like we're living in hell, right? And all of the image all of the images that have come out of there through through the papers have been visceral and evocative in a way. Um, I don't know that 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 certainly startles me, but I think they gives they gives further further insight on on they give further insight to to the I guess to to the lack of of of, of solace that I think is available on 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 a scale like that. And I wonder in which way uh, we can contrast like that experience of like watching basically an, an entire nation destroyed 
right? And and like the the own sort of pain in life and like my own life and and, and how different different solace is needed for those to experience and maybe on one level there there is no solace. We you you could you could say I know it's like I struggle to even say this sentence because I feel like I'm being a bad Christian. But like to wonder I mean, yeah. So I think there's a lot of wisdom around the table um, that um, people can can hear and learn from. I didn't uh, realize. I think people are ready to speak. Um, so I'm glad that this happened, and um, I'm sure you'll continue these conversations with each other. Um, I think this was part of what you were saying about the stuckness, you need to have someone else to talk to. <laughs> so Lydia was saying that, that one of the things is that needing someone else to talk to. Or um, even someone else to be silent with. Right, right. So there is this being a good friend around the table that somehow has happened unexpectedly, uh, which is, uh, there's a lot of and I think I was, when I was listening to this, um, Sarah Joe talking about this kind of balance point between knowing the abyss and moving forward, that kind of thing. Um, I think that's just part of the whole process of education, right? That's the wisdom that we're all striving for in text and experience to try to find that right balance point for the right moment, for each moment. Right, it's not it's not a given, but so Job is is part of something that is a, a wisdom that we're striving to internalize, and everybody's clearly has a huge amount of private pain that giving expression to, or um, it's and so you know Job. Job's voice is not falling into an empty can, it's falling into the soul of everybody who's had a life and different kinds of losses. So it's a kind of a great thing to have you know, all people around the table be willing to say that in ways I think that everybody could be learning. Um, you know, I'm, older than, I'm older than you, but I don't think that the issue there's no simple solution, you know, there's ongoing losses, ongoing questions, and you try to learn and build on it, but each one has its own special character because it's a different love and it's a different loss and it's a different moment in your life. Um, the, um, I was just sort of thinking then maybe we'll, the, um, Just trying to think of two, two, two things that I tried to convey to my my sons when they were growing up that uh, that, that occurs to me as we're talking around um, the table. Um, the first relates to this issue of gathering a kind of wisdom and. Um, <coughs> I, I personally don't think, well, so what, one of the things that I wanted to convey is, whether it's in theological terms or whatever, I would probably convey it in theological terms, but it's the, the category of readiness. You try to build up a wisdom of experience and talking and remembering so that when it happens, you can bring the resources a little bit faster than you might have otherwise. Right? So, I, so for me, that's a big value. That you learn and you learn from the suffering and you read in books and you learn from friends to create a readiness so that You'll do it 
well, so that I will age well, right? That I can do things and um, I won't be ashamed of the values that I was espousing, that they can come to presence when I need them, hopefully. So if there's any issue of how prayer or ritual works is to keep the stuff in mind so that it can, you can be ready and it can be present and you won't feel empty somehow or so that's the first side it's it's trying to preparing in readiness and I think that's a sacred task um, and I don't think it simply includes religious learning it's everything it's a kind of hope um, there is a a phrase that's drawn from the Psalms but it appears at the end of one of the concluding prayers in the morning service, the traditional Jewish morning service <coughs> that so that you will not so a person will not be overwhelmed and thrown <coughs> thrown into the ditch, that you're doing things that so you won't create more shame or create more confusion, and you can somehow have some backbone when the crisis comes, and that you can have access to it. So that's the first thing that I thought of always wanting to convey to the kids and my two sons, but it's also really talking, you're always talking to yourselves when you're doing that. They have to do it in their own way. And the other is related to that, um, but perhaps it's um, it's related to the fact that these things become overwhelming, and so related to that is it's not like you don't fall. It's the way these stand up again, right? It's not that you don't fall, right? So it's and that readiness is part of what helps you stand up again. Not by denial or digging a hole for it, but that somehow those resources... So, I mean, so obviously in the context of being a father for kids, it's really the question, you know, like you're losing... It's not like you don't lose your temper or go cuckoo in the house, but how fast can you come back to yourself? So it's not like because we're just persons, right? So, but how, what resources do you re-access to get back to your better self? That's just at the simple level, the harder level is to get back to some kind of a balancing point within this framework of tragedy. So at least those two aspects, you know, I've, when you try to live with an integrity as a parent, um, so, we try to convey things like that. And I think that's part of this wisdom that I've been hearing around the table as well, trying to be attentive, the readiness to be attentive to what's happening. It's an attentiveness, a readiness. You cultivate a readiness to be attentive as best you can. It's not like there's a right way. You try, so you try to be the best friend who had been sitting in silence and then... When you open your mouth, what do you then say? Right? That's a, there's a great big wisdom there. Um, and then the other is that when you've been rebuked or you're aware that you did the wrong thing, how do you regroup? Right? And so because we see these friends also, they're trying to they hear something they didn't want to hear, and then they're regrouping, either defensively and not defensively, and what. What are they holding on to? So, I don't know how to make a transition here. There's no transition. Um, <laughs> so we'll just plunge forward. Um, I'm not going to say everything that I was going to say as a kind of introduction to chapter um, 32 and following. Um, I'll just say one thing as a, I think for me part of 
the um, spiritual and literary power of having 32 to 37 following 28 is that 28 is anonymous. I was speaking for the positive of the anonymous that could go to everybody. And it, was speak, and it speaks in the abstract. And I think as part of the transition or something of the wisdom that the authorship of Job has conceived is that you have to have one more final statement directly to that person that leads him not out of unknowing but into some kind of a more humble knowing, right? So there's something of that. And one of the things that we'll see that struck me, and I'll look at four kinds of examples from 32 to 37, is that this is one of the clearest places in the book where a person, in this case a younger person who dares to say what the elders who are only speaking from the past, he cites Job's words exactly. There'd be four or five times. So Job has to hear his words in the mouth of a person who is hearing his voice, right? In the other cases, 28, there is a great claim of the, of the of unknowing. And there's a great wisdom in that chapter. I think there's also another kind of wisdom as one is moving towards the teaching of God is that now to hear a voice of another person who says, I heard what you said and now I'm going to reframe that in a new way. And part of what I think Elihu does is he says, I hear you, talking our language, here's what you said, and I'm not just going to rebut it with words of tradition. I'm going to try to take that language and reframe it into a way that will allow you to have insight. Because if I just rebutted what you said, <coughs> then you'll rebut back. And so there's a slow teaching here about something about how insight happens, that it's your language that has to somehow be reframed and widened so that you can hear it in a... It's not so-and-so's language, it's not so -so, but it's your language that's now reframed and widened and deepened. And somehow insight can happen there, and it's only at that point, I think, that there's a readiness or possibility for Job to hear God's voice, which is now a real claim to shift insight, right? Uh, because part of the movement that we're going through is the movement from egocentricity to a form of a divine speech which will never mention a human being, but will be addressed to a human being. And you have to be ready to hear this shift from the egocentric, where you're in the cent you're thinking things from your center point. Um, and he has to be shifted away. So what I um, would like to do is to actually do something a little bit slightly different, in the sense that. I think one of the things that Elihu does is that he's saying to Job, you're not alone in the universe. God has been speaking to you all the time, but the language that's been used has been covering it over. And you need to try to hear another way in which God speaks, not as God giving God's will, to do certain things that require you then to kind of rethink the measurability or the commensurability of things, right? That 
but they should, you know, there's a sense of retributive justice. I'm not getting my just desserts and so on and so forth. But there's another way that God speaks that I think begins to emerge in the Elihu speeches so that you can hear God speak in 38 and following. Because you, you might be harder to do. So, um, let's take a look at the first one, which is um, in chapter 33. I'm going to look at like four, three or four moments. So in this, um, in this first moment, um, where do we have, um, so in 33.8, he says, Indeed, you have stated in my hearing. What are you saying? 33 8. Oh. Indeed, you have stated in my hearing. He's citing, he's quoting Job. This is the first quotation. He quotes him. You have stated in my hearing, I heard the word spoken. Now he's quoting Job. I am guiltless, <coughs> free of transgression. I am innocent, without iniquity. But he finds reasons to oppose me. I'm reading the JPS translation. He considers me his enemy. He puts my feet in stocks, watches all my ways. And on your own, you can compare that with chapter 13, verses 8 and then 27. And then Elihu answers. He says... Lot Sadakta, you're not right. This is not the way to talk. And I will answer you. And he begins to say, and this is the key transition that I want to focus on, because he's telling us how he wants to reframe the argument. In this you are not right, Lot Sadakta. You don't have a this is not the claim that you can make against God that I'm guiltless, free of transgression. It's not like you have to think differently. I will answer you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to respond. God is greater than any man. Why do you complain against him? That he doesn't respond to your particular way of framing the charges? Right? You're framing an argument and you're upset that God's not answering the charges that you're framing in your terms. And then he says, and this is the key part of the transition, for God speaks time and again. So in, in Hebrew, God speaks over and over again. God has been speaking. You're claiming that there has been no voice. <coughs> but there is a voice, though man, though a person does not perceive it. Right? So this is a, a, two, a new way that there is a voice that's been coming from God and the way you frame the challenge to God who is transcendent and beyond categories, has been forced you to mishear what you could have been hearing all along. Right? So what's the first way that a God can speak that's different from the way that God speaks in Scripture or whatever? Okay? That, he, that Elihu is going to try to shift your head, to turn your head around a bit, and to say, attend to this, and did, 
this is a kind of divine speech that's coming from someplace else. So the first, he says, it's in, in dreams. The first is the dream work. In a dream, a night vision, when deep sleep falls on men when they, while they slumber on their beds, then he, God, opens men's understanding. Pay attention to what the words are. In sleep, there is an opening of understanding. In the dream, there's an opening of understanding. And by disciplining them, leaves his signature. There's a way that God has left a trace of God's speech by an opening, a cracking opening of your mind. So the first question is, what does he mean? What could he mean? What could he mean? Well, I think one thing that he may be meaning is that the syntax of dreams is not the syntax of the waking day. It's making you aware that there's more going on than the way you talk about things when you're awake. So what do dreams teach? We're trying to fill in what Elihu is not saying. What might dreams teach you know, when God is trying to open your mind through dreams? Because it's a different way that God is speaking. God is speaking the reality of the world that's coming into your consciousness through your unconscious while you're dreaming. Right? It's a, a different kind of communication. He's not telling you anything. He's trying to create a new awareness. So it's a new logic, a different kind of grammar. it creates a new humility about the day world, in my terms. It's a new humility about the day world. So it's the first kind of challenge to pride. It's not just saying you're, you're a nothing, you have no right to make a claim, right? And Eliphaz said that the dream was a terror, made the hair stand up on the back of his neck. It's not what he's saying. One thing about the dream then does is it opens up a different humility about the day world because of the night world. That you become in touch with things that you repress. You become in touch with images that are different. The jumble of the logic of the night language is different from the logic of the day language. And that is one of the ways that God opens your understanding. He hasn't told you anything, but he's opened your mind. If, because he's saying this is one of the ways that God speaks, if you were listening. Words, he's making you aware of the presumptiveness of assuming that the way you frame things in the daytime is the only way that it can be framed. And you had to learn that through your nighttime talk. So there's not an instruction, it's an opening of understanding. That it is a first move of humility, simply by the way God cracks open your head. Because he's not willing to say that this is not God. God is bringing all of this, and it's part of the fullness of the world that God speaks into being. Can you hear that? Was, what did you hear? that my language, God is other, and your language was only a tiny, small, daytime framing. It's very different from talking about the commensurability of reward and punishment. I got my just desserts. He's not <coughs> talking in those terms. God has simply made you aware of that. That seems to be one kind of way 
that God is cracking your egg open. Okay? So what's the second way? Begins on 19. So he says, he is reproved by pains on his bed. So here we have suffering but not redemptive suffering. We have, there's something, we're going to talk about what is, what is the suffering that is a wisdom that's coming through now your body, not just through your dreams. And the trembling in his bones is constant. Something that God is revealing through the pain. That's the pain of the world that God has created. So the person detests food. Fine food is repulsive. His flesh wastes. His bones are rubbed away. There's a confrontation with death. Pain becomes this primary intimation of mortality of limit, fragility, end. He comes close to the pit. His life verges on death. So this is the biblical way of talking, right? He's using biblical hermeneutics and language. It's not an abstract statement. That in the pain, you have to look at what you didn't want to look at, right? The humility of a, of a fragile life. And you have to feel that in your bones, he's saying. You have to feel that. It's a wisdom that's not coming through the bones. And your body wasting away. It's not your body betraying you. But it's a teaching, he says. And then he says if one has an, a representative, an advocate, to declare the person's uprightness, then he has mercy on him and decrees, redeems him from descending into the pit. He's obtained a ransom, <coughs> and his flesh becomes healthier. He prays to God and says, And then he says, I have sinned, I have perverted what is right, but I was not paid back for. So if we try to understand what's being said, not just as a repetition of the old, but as some <clears throat> initiation into the new, this waiting for this, um, the advocate, right, is a divine angelic presence that comes to consciousness when one comes to terms with this. And then the soul is ransomed from death. That is to say, from complete despair. Right? So it's happening, he's using this forensic language, but in a different way. And then the person is able to say, I have sinned, I have perverted what is right, and I was not paid back for it. There's a shifting away from retributive justice and the confession now is the confession of false expectations, right? Because one has come to terms in a different sense with mortal existence. And that just as there's a voice that speaks through the dream, there's someone that says to you in the suffering, I, you, you, you know, you've seen it, and now I will heal you, and you can go on. Right? There's some kind of blessing that the advocate is giving. It's not just some kind of an angel descending from heaven, but it's part of that voice of God that's speaking through the suffering. That's now taking the shape, not of dream work, but of an advocate that says, You've hit the abyss, and you've come to consciousness of it, and then the person is able to say, I've sinned because I spoke falsely about the world, falsely about all these things. We're trying to read these things. Some of this language harks back to earlier things, but if this is a new moment, 
can you read this in the context of this new moment when he's saying God is going to speak with you? In the context of this great unknowing that we've had to go through through chapter 28. So that's the second thing. Okay, so the first was the, the mysterious humility that comes through dreams. The second is a new awareness that comes through suffering. It's not a disciplining, it's not redemptive. It's just a wisdom of learning that this is real, death is real, and that, that causes you to think about the way you were talking about the world in a different way. Right. Can you clarify what you were saying there when you talk about retributive justice in there? Uh, that it's not that you get your just desserts, that, you, that I did X and I should expect Y. Just, life just is. It just is. And you come to terms with that when you can really come to terms with your death, <laughs> not as a reward or punishment, but death it just is. And then you, feel, then you become aware, you have to confess something when you become aware of that. Sure. You have to confess something. And that's what the text is saying in biblical terms. And the moment of awareness is the advocate saying, you know, you've, you've hit that brink point. And now you answer it back. So that's the second possibility. I'm not, you know, see whether you can swallow all this, whether it makes sense, but that's just the second possibility. <clears throat> What's the third? So the third, jump to chapter 34. Verses 5 and 6 and 9 is again a citation of Job. For Job has said, you have said, I am right. God has deprived me of justice. Right? I declare the judgment against me false. This is Job speaking. My arrow wound is deadly though I am free from transgression. Right? So this assertion of I'm right, again, this kind of formulation, and if you go back and take a look at uh, on your own, on chapter 9, verses 32 to 33, and chapter 15, verse 3, you'll see it's a pretty near citation of what Job had been saying. So what is the way that God, what, what is the wisdom that's happening? Just jump down to, you see, um, he begins in verse 16, but he goes on, if you would understand the sense of this, give ear to what I say. <coughs> would one who hates justice govern? He begins to talk about the transcendence and mightiness of the ways of God, but not in any way that's talking about reward and punishment. All things come before God, and God does what God does. And then he says, in addition, God listens to the ones he... Some people are crushed, some are struck down, some are disloyal and they're punished. And the person hasn't, how could anyone understand what's going on? He lets the cry of the poor come before him. He listens to the cry of the needy, but sometimes he's silent. Who will condemn God? If he hides his face, who will see him? So he goes on to say that a person, he says, Job speaks without knowledge. His works, words lack understanding. Would that Job were tried to the limit. He increases his transgressions. What are the transgressions? 
that Elihu may be saying in this. And that is the presumption of understanding the meanings of God. It's not, in this case, a question of saying, we don't know why there's silence and why sometimes the cry comes and then God hides God's face. And sometimes there's punishment and there's not. So this is the pride of expectation. That the human being sets the terms for how things happen in the world. So he's first raised this question of this huge magnitude of God. But then there's an attempt to try to assume that the logic of how God should act conforms to human logic and human expectation. And he's speaking against that. So there's a slightly different kind of statement of humility than is the other form. And then there is one more citation and then a very massive movement in the text. So you jump to 35. And Elihu says, and he's quoting Job again for the third time, do you think it's just to say I am right against God? If you ask how it benefits you, what have I gained from not sinning? So he's quoting chapter 7, verse 20, where Job had said, if I sin, how is that hurting you? So why are you so, why is this punishment so out of proportion to what I've gone through? When Job was speaking that, Job was trying to correlate divine power and divine morality as he thought that it had to happen in a certain way. And now the statement is different. So he's saying, it's a very interesting statement. He says that human actions are incommensurable. If you sin, look at, look at, behold the heavens, verse 5. Behold the heavens and see. Look at the skies high above you. If you sin, what do you do to him? If your transgressions are many, how do you affect him? He's taking his words and reframing them in a different way. He was saying, if I've sinned against you, how does that affect you? So, you know, bug off, God, leave me alone, give me some space. Right? And now he's saying, there is this huge gap between what a human being does and God. It doesn't affect God in the least. You have to, I'm taking your words, and you've got to reframe what you were saying in a much larger framework. If you're righteous, what do you give him? If you sin, how do you hurt God? Not a bit, not either way. What does he receive from your hands? And now we have one of the most powerful statements in the entire book from this perspective. <coughs> your wickedness affects people like yourself, your righteousness mortals. Right? When you use the language wrongly, the only person you harm is your own mind and soul. And when you act wrongly, you're hurting other people. He's trying to get Job to reconceive the universe of the power of actions under heaven are not affecting God, they're affecting his soul, his mind, and other human beings. And then 
goes on. I just want to just check on this translation because um, uh, sorry about this. Um, okay. Verses 8, and then, um, oh, here we are. So I, it's the translations wrong that screwed me up. <laughs> so he says, because of contention, the oppressed cried out. They shout because of the power of the great. But none says, this is the new shift in consciousness. No one says, where is my God, my maker, not who gives strength in the night. That tra- I don't know what your translation is. Zmirot. Belayla, but it really means God gives the capacity for poetry and song. It's a it's a double pun. There's a strength in the poetry and the song of the night. Who gives us more knowledge than the beasts of the earth, makes us wiser than the birds of the sky, because they cry out, but he doesn't respond because of the arrogance. What does God give human beings? He gives them the capacity to transcend suffering with song, with poetry. To turn the terrors of the night into a strength through literature, through song, through prayer, through whatever. That's a strength that God has been giving to the human spirit to turn that into some form of wisdom, some form of deep understanding, which is an inner strength, and it's the strength that poetry gives. It's this strange aspect of turning horror into literature or poetry. So there's something here that he's saying is something else that God has given. God has given a strength to transcend pain through the poetic act, through the act of creativity. He wants you to become aware that your actions, this is Elihu's new, because he's shifting the ground away from a certain kind of divine providence. God's providence is not that he's got his eye on you. God is already giving you the resources to find a certain form of balance in the world. By dreams, by these speeches, by this wisdom, and by the human capacity to be better than birds or different than birds, right? They too cry out and God doesn't respond. And human beings cry out, but they give each other and the self strength through poetry, through collective action. Any way that you would want to understand what those mirot are. Is it the poetry of tradition? Is it the poetry of poetry? Is it the poetry of music? It's all those things that give strength in suffering. And that's given by God. Right? It's not a God whose providence is saying, I'm going to give you ten jujubes for every ten good deeds. But it's a speech and it's a giving of God because it's all coming from God, from Elihu's point of view. Right? It's a gradual shifting of the ground by taking his language and turning it inside out. And by saying, by talking the language of retributive justice. Am I doing right by God? Is God doing right by me? In my terms, you've been covering over a voice that's been, many voices that have been speaking to you from the depths. This is Elliot, right? You have to decide whether this makes sense and it's real to you, or what you can take away from it. But this is at least Elihu trying to change Job's consciousness. He's not denying suffering, 
He's not denying mortality. He's not denying all these things, but he's telling you, you can learn from this as a teaching from God. God has been speaking to you, right? This is not coming, this is not just some add-on to your ice cream cone. Sprinkles or juices or whatever. Right? It's not just something, it's not an add-on. This is part of the truth of it. Right? If your head is willing to think about it this way. You were thinking about it all differently. And so you couldn't hear this voice that's been speaking to you all the time through your suffering, your mortality, your dreams, and your own capacity to create meaning through song or speech or music, however you want to understand that. Where did that gift come from, he's saying? It's a constant God speaking that you have to hear it and then make use of it. Right? He's trying to get Job to change his head. And then, lo and behold, <laughs> who does it he simply sings and the singing that he sings will prepare us for God's voice he just does it he'll show you what it's like so listen to what he says is God's voice that's been speaking to you out of the depths of the universe that you can now turn into song Because of this too, my heart quakes. I hope the world is a terror. It is a place of instability. Just listen to the noise of his rumbling, to the sound that comes out of his mouth. Can you hear God speaking? He's not speaking that this is not the child that God speaks the thunder. This is, can you hear this now that you've gone through this, that God speaks the thunder, right? that God speaks the earthquake. His lightning to the end of the earth, after he lets out a roar, he thunders in his majestic voice. Right? This is beyond the sense of the child and the anthropomorphic. This is at the level of poetry. Right? And now he's singing the song that celebrates those that speech of God in the thunder, in the terror, in the earthquake. No one can find a trace of it by the time his voice is heard. Right? It rumbles and it ascends into the distant space. By the time it gets to you, but you still have a trace of that voice. Right? It's a great voice that's speaking and you only have a trace of it. God thunders marvelously with his voice. His works wonders that we cannot understand. He commands to the snow, fall to the ground. And the downpour of rain, his mighty downpour of rain, is a sign on every man's hand that all may know his doings. The storm wind comes from its chamber, the cold from the constellations. By the breath of God, ice is formed, and the expanse of water becomes solid. He also loads the clouds with moisture and scatters his lightning. Give here heed to this, Job, he says in verse 14. Consider the marvels of God. But it's not like the marvels of God of God are just there. You had to hear them and talk about them as marvels. Right? That's, what, that's part of what this instruction is. It's all going on, but now can you give voice to the tremendum? Can you just give it a voice that gives you strength in the night? Right? That's the strength in the night. It's not changing anything. And it's not saying that it's not a human voice that's transforming it. 
it's anthropomorphic down to the bottom. But it's responding to some trace that's been happening far, far away, and you're just getting an echo of it. Right? He says it. And you have to put it in human real terms. So you're putting it in anthropomorphic terms. Not like a child, but as a transformer of the trace. Because it wouldn't be marble, it wouldn't be the ice from God's mouth, it wouldn't be the breath of God that creates ice, that's poetry. Right? To say that God has an icy breath is terrifying, but that's poetry. Because it's forcing your mind to live within this space with a terrible beauty. Right? I think maybe the only the poet that comes closest to perceiving that, we have to go back, look at the first of the Duino elegies. Right? Rilke understood this. He says, we live in a gedoitete Welt. We live in an interpreted world. Where everything we're saying is interpreted in language. And the angels give us just enough ability to withstand the terror to turn it into beauty. That's what he says. It's terrifying. And there's je- with the, the capacity to withstand that is then to feel it as the terror. To feel that terror as something awesome and sublime and beautiful. <coughs> That's, we have just enough capacity of language. That's a very delicate point where you don't close it up and say it's terror, and you don't transform it, but you're at this balance point. Just enough language to let something of the truth of God come, come through and turn it into something that remains godly but now has a kind of beauty that gives you strength to live. Right? So that's how he, so and you see how he comes. Um, do you, look in verse 15, do you know what charge God lays upon them when his lightning clouds shine? You know, right? It's, right. Well, you, you, your head that was thinking of punishment and reward is not the issue. Right? This is Job, you may disagree, but this is the way Job, this is the way Elihu is helping us now to get ready for God's speech. Do you know the marvels worked upon the expanse of the clouds by him whose understanding is perfect? Why your clothes become hot when the land is become by the self wind? By the north wind, the golden rays emerge. The splendor about God is awesome. Shaddai, we cannot attain to him. He is great in power and justice and abundant in righteousness. He does not torment. Therefore, men are in awe of him. All that's left is a new sense of reverence. The poetry creates a new reverence. who none of the wise can perceive, because they were filled with their own sense of wisdom. And they couldn't hear the wisdom of God, but it's not a wisdom that fits into the calculus of right and wrong in a certain sense. It's not like that order of existence of justice and right and turning from evil is wrong. But this, this is affecting your soul and your other person. It's not affecting God. God creates the universe with all these possibilities. This is part of what Elihu's particular wisdom is trying to convey. And your hearing of it is a, a dim trace of that voice. And you try not to betray it by poetry. Right? You try not to betray it by poetry, but Poetry is the only access you have to something of that marvel. Otherwise, it's silent. God is not. But this, this icy breath and all that, that's part of God's speech. Okay. 
the same way the voice of the dream and this teaching of God through suffering. It's a different kind of divine voice that's teaching you if you can hear it. It's a different kind of Sinai or a different kind of Calgary, whatever. But what's being conveyed has to be heard differently. And so Elihu concludes getting us ready for God's speech, not by argument, but simply singing what he was preaching. He just does it. Right? He gives something of that voice of song to help you hear what you couldn't have heard otherwise. So then there's nothing more to say because he's come as close to God as you can come and now God will speak. Okay. So there's no confusion that the poetry and the music of the night is a human voice. You try to catch it in a godly manner. That's all. Right? As best you can before... You know, it's coming through this human filter of poetry, of language. So it has to. So you try to catch it so it still reveals the trace of God <coughs> and not the voice of the human. But it is a human voice. And you have to leave in that balance point. So one of, the, one of the ways that the divine grammar speaks is to make, make you aware of that night, that night vision makes you aware of day vision in a new way. It's a different kind of communication. This is my world. This is, and be careful what you say about it. Right? Awareness of really facing death and mortality is a different kind of a wisdom. Right? And this notion of song. In all of these cases, I think it's quite remarkable that some of the old arguments are there and they're reframed in Job's old language, but then there's a widening of his mind. And then Elihu doesn't stop the dialogues by simply speaking unknowability, that only God knows what Chachma is. But he's trying to lead you somewhere within the interhuman to a new perception. There's a, there's a funny point he's saying where the trace, the unknowable trace, is put into poetry or song or music. And it's at this boundary point between the divine and the human. Right? Too much human stuff will muffle God. And too much God can't be heard. So there is this very delicate filtering that gives you a God consciousness in human terms. But somehow stays on that boundary point that you know there's something other which is the otherness of God. I think that is part of this astonishing statement, so that these statements that the splendor of God is awesome, you can't attain to Shaddai, is not just a redundant repetition of these older arguments by the friends. You can hear that it's a different teaching than the friends, because he's come to it with a new wisdom and understanding. So in the end, therefore, humans are in awe of him. There's a different kind of terror, of tremendum, of this awe. And it's this awareness now that lets the divine voice be heard. Again, it's going to be, now God's going to sing poetry about who God is. It's, the, it's another poet doing it. 
but there's a shift in the poetic voice from Elihu and now the most daring of shifts that God is going to sing something of God's Godding into the world. Right? He's not, he's not going to say his concept. He, God can only... God is God, God gods. And we're going to overhear what it means that God gods. Right? That's all that's going to happen in chapter 3. God is Godding. He's telling you how God gods. Right? Because now you can hear that. And you couldn't have heard that before. It's not God creator, but God gods. So, those of us who are moving across the scope of the book have been with Job to get ready to hear that. Whether this is true or not is for you to decide. This is the vision of the book of Job, right? Um, but it's a very great wisdom that you can't duck. You're going to have to walk across this speed bump, <laughs> right? and decide for yourself how it works. But that's the greatness of a text like this. You have to stand with it and go through it, right? Or know why you ducked under the table and live with that for the rest of your life. All right, so first I want to just thank you for all the personal communications. I'm sure that you'll keep talking with each other. Um, I found it. It's really a blessing to hear that I'm, I'm reading the stuff that you're giving me, but now this is your voice was, was very, very lovely. Uh, totally unexpected, so that was the greatest part of the, the thing. And you continue talking with each other. Get yourself unstuck. <laughs> All right. See you next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm.